Good morning and welcome to worship on this, the last Sunday of end time, the last Sunday of the church year, Christ the King Sunday. Today we're going to note that even though many people did not recognize Jesus as a king while he was here on this earth, yet by faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we do so today. And we see that royalty and how in royal love our Savior serves us. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of him whose crown of thorns has been exchanged for a crown of glory dear friends in Christ Jesus. Friday night is usually movie night in the Rockoff home. This past Friday, we rented the movie Mulan. It's the story of a young Chinese girl who disguises herself as a male warrior in order to take her father's place in the Imperial Army. Now, if you enjoyed the animated version that came out back in 1998, you might find it worthwhile to check out this movie. There's, there's action, great cinematography. And we see that for most of the movie, Mulan, she was able to hide the fact that she was a girl until finally her true identity was revealed. Things looked grim for a while after that, but finally, well, I'm not going to ruin the ending for you. But none of the other soldiers knew that Milan was actually a girl with, with skills unmatched by any other warrior. So no one treated her any differently, not until they found out who she was. Now from eternity, Jesus knew that he was a king, but for, mo but for most of his life, no one treated him like royalty, except for that brief time, perhaps when entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But once he was taken into custody by the Jews and then handed over to the Romans, no one acted, acted as if they were in the presence of the king of kings. And yet this didn't stop Jesus from doing what he came to do, for he came to fulfill what was promised long ago, he came to be our king. He came to serve. And this morning we see what was behind our Lord's desire to serve sinful people like you and me. On this Christ the King Sunday, we see Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as he shows us how royal love serves. Let's take that as our theme this morning, royal love serves. I'll point out a couple of things today. First of all, that Jesus was given what we might call the royal treatment. We'll explain that. But also though, God, he gave us a royal gift. As we take a look at our savior, we realize that his reign was not limited by any earthly boundaries. As he told Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. No, Jesus' kingdom is found in the hearts of all believers. That makes him king over all the earth and beyond. And as such, Jesus deserves royal treatment. Well, sadly, Jesus did get the royal treatment, but not the kind he deserved. Taking a look at the words before us this morning, we see Jesus having just been handed over by Pilate, that spineless Roman governor, to be taken away and crucified. But before his execution took place, the Roman soldiers, they decided to have some fun with this condemned criminal. Large crowd gathered to watch the festivities. 
takes us to the opening verse of our text, verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus in the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. That term, the whole company, in, in, in Roman terminology, meant anywhere from maybe 600 to 1,000 soldiers. So it's quite a group. They had heard that the king had been on trial there, and they all came to see him. And today, thousands will gather when royalty, such as the Queen of England, is making an appearance. Well, Jesus, the king of the Jews, he drew a crowd of his own that day as well. This crowd, however, didn't gather to pay respect to Jesus. Instead, we're told differently in verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. This mob of soldiers was all about publicly humiliating Jesus, stripping him naked and finding some cloak to throw over him. Someone must have come up with, with the comedic idea, hey, if, if they're calling him the king of the Jews, let's, let's make him look like a king. So they rounded up and adorned him with what was probably an old dirty robe that resembled the purple robes worn by kings and other royalty. You see, the purple color for royal robes came from a very expensive dye. And because it costs so much to produce, that color purple was usually worn only by the wealthy or by royalty. And dressing Jesus in a similar robe, it wasn't done to praise him. No, they were holding him up for, for public ridicule. But they didn't stop there, because after all, every king needs a crown. We're told in verse, in verse uh, 29, they put a staff, oh, oops, I'm sorry, verse 29, they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Someone cut a branch off of some thorny bush and, and bent it into the shape of a laurel wreath like, like Caesar would wear it. But this particular crown didn't look or feel anything like that of Caesar's. Among the several different thorny plants in Palestine were found those with thorns that could be anywhere from an inch to five inches long. And now they, they weren't like the thorns on the roses that, that you give or receive on Valentine's Day. No, the crown of thorns, these crown of thorns, this, this crown of thorns could do so much more serious damage and inflict some very excruciating pain. And yet the soldiers, they still weren't done. We read on. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. In essence, they gave him a big stick. They, they were pretending it was a scepter. The scepters of kings, usually they were quite fancy. They were covered in gold and precious gems. They represented the power and authority of a king. Well, here, though, Jesus was, was given a stick. And to those putting together this humiliating scene, Jesus now, he, he looked the part of a king. So it was time to give him more of the royal treatment. We're told the soldiers bowed down to him and proclaimed, Hail, King of the Jews. And in their constant mockery of Jesus, we can see the hatred these Roman soldiers had for the Jewish people in general. Verse 30, it says, they spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. It's again and again, they took their hatred out on this king of the Jews. And we cringe while picturing the scene, fully aware of who Jesus was and, and what he came to do. And we may even ask ourselves, how could they be so cruel? Well, remember, these are professional Roman soldiers, well-trained in the art of inflicting pain. It was their job to follow orders, to break people down, finally to put them to death. So instead of asking, how could they be so cruel? Well, that's what they're supposed to do. Maybe a, a better question would be, how can we be so cruel? Because so often we're also guilty of dishing out the royal treatment uh, to, to those around us. For, for example, we tease and make fun of those who aren't like us at school, often behind their backs. Maybe with our coworkers or family members, we lash out just because we might be having a, a bad day ourselves. And if someone should ever think to say an unkind word to us, well, we're often quick to fire back with an unkind word or two of our own. And if we're giving the royal treatment to those around us, we're really doing it to our Lord as well. The soldiers, they did so in mockery. Maybe the way we mistreat our Lord is, is not done with the intent of mocking him, 
but are we guilty of often showing a lack of sincerity toward him? For example, when we assemble in his house to praise our savior, um, do we ever find ourselves doing so mindlessly? Do we sometimes just go through the motions when, when we pray, like when we pray the Lord's prayer? Or how about when we sing the hymns? I get it, it's, it's not that easy to sing with a mask on your face, but there, there's no reason why we shouldn't at least be following along with the words being sung. Do we make the effort to be engaged in worship? Do we listen to the parts of the service, the liturgy and the readings and then the sermon? Or is it too easy to daydream and let our minds wander to when the football game starts or what we're going to have for lunch? leading us to forget the whole reason why we're there in the first place. Is that any way to treat the king of kings? So maybe the question is, how can we be so cruel? And the answer, well, it's in our nature, our sinful nature. That's what we've become because of sin. And it's important for us to recognize what sin has done to us. Maybe this will help. I read that back in, in 1971, about 50 years ago, there was a Stanford psychology experiment that really showed just what sin has, has done to the human heart. They had volunteers that were rounded up and interviewed to make sure they, they were, for the most part, emotionally stable people. And then some of them were randomly chosen to be prison guards, and they had one job. They were to take care of the inmates. The rest that weren't the prison guards were chosen to be the inmates. And this experiment was originally planned to last for two weeks, but they had to cut it short after only six days. And here's why, because by then the guards had become so exceedingly heartless in their treatment of the pretend inmates. They'd caused such severe, severe stress and symptoms of depression amongst these people. And even those running the experiment, well, they started acting kind of like prison wardens instead of, of observing psychologists. Several of the inmates, uh, ultimately were diagnosed with acute emotional disturbance, disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying, and, and rage. The experiment had totally gotten out of hand. But it does exhibit what you and I are by nature. We're sinful, cruel, heartless human beings. And just like these Roman soldiers, we too are guilty of giving Jesus the royal treatment. Thankfully, God doesn't return the favor. Instead of giving us the royal treatment that we deserve, instead he gives us a royal gift, his very own son. He promised and prophesied everything that was taking place with Jesus. Through Isaiah, God pictured the suffering of his son in this way. He said, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Yes, that's what's happened to Jesus. Happened to Jesus. And yet it was all part of the father's plan. And so was the ultimate mistreatment of our king that took place next in verse 31. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. It was there on that cross that Jesus was treated not as a king, but as our sins deserved. For he had no sin of his own but he was still punished for hours. And now they're all gone. Every sin of mistreating others with a condescending attitude, every sin of mistreating God with half-hearted worship, every word spoken against others and against our Lord, every sin is gone. And that's because Christ the King paid for them all. It said that Napoleon was quite the motivator of his troops. Whenever he's planning on visiting a certain regiment, he'd find out ahead of time some information about a particular soldier who had served well, but perhaps had not received any public recognition for it. So when it came time to review the troops, Napoleon would receive a signal from the colonel in charge that day. When he came to that certain soldier, at which time Napoleon would stop, he'd single the man out, greet him warmly and compliment him, on his loyalty and bravery in front of all the other soldiers. And so those other soldiers, they were always so impressed. They, they believed that Napoleon cared that much about each of them and such personal and public recognition would then motivate them to fight all the more for this man. Well, unlike Napoleon, Jesus didn't come into the ranks of this world just to get to know one person. No, he came to get to know all of us. And he didn't come just to motivate us to fight better. 
No, he came to fight for us and to win for us salvation. And this is what made Jesus such a different leader, such a different king than what this world has to offer. It seems as if leaders today, including so many of our political candidates, they can make all sorts of promises and pledges to help the people who help them get elected. But once in office, the decisions they make become so self-serving, both politically and personally. The people then, they're not served. They end up losing out. Well, it's not so with Jesus. He is the king over all creation, but he doesn't rule with only his own interests in mind. Otherwise, think of it. He would never have left his throne in heaven to enter our world. No, he rules for each of us making decisions on our behalf, just as he promised when he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes, Jesus is God's royal gift to us. The savior who brings us another gift, our salvation. And in response to these gifts, we offer a gift ourselves. We no longer live for ourselves. Now we live for him who died for us and was raised again. What the Roman soldiers said and did in mockery, we offer in truth when we proclaim, Hail Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. We give that praise when we assemble in his house. We give it to him with heartfelt prayers and worship in our homes. And we give it to him through our offerings. We give it to him by using our time and talents in the various ministries of our church. And we give God honor and praise when we give it to others. So instead of mocking or simply ignoring others, we treat them with love and respect. We greet people with a smile, even it might be hidden under a mask and a kind word. We welcome fellow members to worship. We invite the unchurched to come to worship with us. We pray for others. In short, we do whatever we can to show others the same love that Christ has shown to us. We reflect the royal love of our King. Royal love that serves. I doubt if any of us have royal blood running through our veins, and yet because of Christ, you and I, we know that we're treated as royalty. We're privileged to look forward to living with our king for all eternity. And that's not just some happy ending to a movie. No, it's reality. And it's all because Christ the king's royal love serves. You, me, and all believers. Amen. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us, but may he turn our hearts to him so that we walk in all his ways. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, on this last Sunday in the church, you return our thoughts to that great and awesome day when Jesus will come again to gather his elect from every time and place. For the believer, it will be a time of joy, peace, and fulfillment. But for those who do not believe, it will be a time of terror and shame. Father, we don't know the day or the hour. Your word only says that the time is short. Give each of us a heart for the lost and the courage to speak the truth to them in love. Turn their hearts to you, O Lord, not for the sake of their good works, Father, but because Jesus shed his blood for them too. Do not let the enemy of our souls triumph in his schemes. Bless the families of our congregation, dear Lord. Give wisdom and patience and good humor to fathers and mothers. The wisdom of Solomon, the patience of Job, the joy of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of God, which always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Guide the children in the way of truth and protect them from the evil one. Bless the leaders of our congregation and all teachers and workers as well. Grant us harmony and a willing spirit to sustain us as we serve as your body in this place. Gather us around your word and sacraments, and by your spirit use these means to nourish our souls. Forgive and renew us, Father, we bear your name. Be with those we know and love who are sick or suffering. Comfort them with your own presence, Lord. Strengthen their faith, and if it be your will, restore their health. Thank you for your assurance that you never leave us or forsake us. Bless those who serve in mercy ministries for the hungry, sick, destitute, or in prison. Provide for the needs around us through your bounty, Father. You've blessed us so richly. Open our hearts to those in need so that they can see firsthand that there is a God in heaven who cares about them. Break the chains of addiction, Lord. So many people are in that kind of bondage in this sin-sick world. Our culture and our society embraces and glorifies things that you hate. Restrain the tempter's power, hinder ungodly influences in our country, 
and cause all good and virtuous industry to prosper. Turn the hearts of the nation to you, O Lord, your kingdom come. Father, we are yours. Hear and answer our prayers as you see fit, for we know that your will is always best, and we know that you love us more than life itself. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we are privileged to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Greetings again this morning. It's good to be worshiping with you in this video format in any case. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. Uh, a couple of changes um, with Thanksgiving worship coming up Wednesday night and then midweek Advent services starting on Wednesdays. Uh, confirmation has moved to Monday, so we'll be having that Monday at 6. Uh, our touring the Old Testament class for the time being will shift to Tuesday nights then at 7 p.m. You're invited to log in. The information will go out later tonight. Uh, how to log in, that starts at 7, goes for an hour, and we're in the book of Judges. So join us on Tuesday night if you're, if you're able to. And then Wednesday night is our Thanksgiving Eve worship service. Uh, it's going to be at 7 o'clock. You're invited to attend if you're willing. I will hopefully be able to put uh, at least the sermon or the uh, devotion, devotional thoughts that we'll be having for that service online so that you can have them if you can't make it that night. So that's going to be um, Wednesday. And then that'll get us back to this coming Sunday, which is the first Sunday of the new church year, first Sunday in Advent already. So it's come up quickly. Again, if, you, if you'd like me to pay you a visit or if you'd like to come to church to receive the Lord's Supper, I, I am available for that. Uh, there are uh, quite a few that have done things like that. So just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll try to get, get that scheduled for you. And if I can do anything for you in any way, uh, don't hesitate to call and let me know. Blessings to all of you. I hope you have a blessed week, uh, blessed and, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. And we'll look forward to once again, gathering around God's word with you in the future. Thank you. Take care.